one. Shalom, hello, my name is Rabbi Johnny Solomon, and I'm delighted to be speaking with Rabbi Avinam Frankel, who, aside from being a highly respected product manager for a leading business management company, is a remarkable Talmud Chacham who blew the Jewish Torah world away with his two-volume Nefesh HaTzimtzum. Last year, Rabbi Frankel published a further volume, this time, and I have it here, uh, a translation and commentary of Rabbi Yosef Ergas's Shome Emunim, along with a brilliant 50-page introduction and an outstanding 300-page Kabbalah overview. So I'd like to begin this conversation by welcoming Rabbi Frankel and by asking you, who was Rabbi Ergas? What makes Shome Emunim such a compelling work? And what inspired you to dedicate such a huge amount of time and energy into translating and writing a commentary on Shome Emunim? Wow. <laughs> Thank you so much, Rabbi Solomon, it's, uh, uh, for your exceedingly kind words, and it's a real pleasure to be here. And it's a pleasure to be interviewed by the virtual rabbi, and <laughs> I, I wish you much success in all of your endeavors, and uh, you should go Mechal El Chayel from strength to strength in everything that you do. So thank, thank you. you. So uh, I guess the place to start, I think, is in the... Uh, just following the Nefesh at Simpson project, I was in an absolute vacuum. I had just finished this very long project, and where was I going to go next? And I got involved in a uh, a discussion in learning, a serious discussion in learning. And uh, uh, the Shakla Batara, the to and fro of that uh, learning, also indirectly touched on this book, Shomer and Munim, by Rabbi Yosef Erogas. And uh, I felt compelled to have to go into this book again. I say again because this book, Shomer Munim, is also uh, a central book to the discussions that were written about that I already wrote about in Nefesh Simpson. But you can read a book one way, and then when you're looking at it in a different context, you see it in a completely different light. And this uh, involved discussion uh, afforded me the opportunity to look at this book, Shomer Munim, in a in a completely different light. And uh, when I did so, I found something utterly beautiful. And I want, to, I want to tell you why, but in order to do so, I'm gonna tell you something, first of all, about Rav Yosef Ergas, who the author of Shomer Emunim. So he was born in, in Italy in 1685. He was a child prodigy, a Talmudic genius. And he, he uh, uh, eventually grew up to become the uh, the rabbi of Livorno, Leghorn, in Italy. Mm -hmm. And he wrote several, several svarim, and uh, by far the uh, the most famous or the most well-known of his svarim is this book, Shomer Munim. Now, I say famous and well-known. It's not well-known at all, but it, if anyone studies Kabbalah, it is well-known as a basic introduction to Kabbalah. But uh, this is certainly the, the, the most significant work or seem to be the most significant work out of, out of all of his works. And he wrote this, he started writing it uh, in the evening of his life, what turned out to be the evening of his life. He started writing this book in 1725 and he completed writing it in the year of his passing in 1730. And he passed away um, tragically at the uh, very young age of 45. Um, what we lost as a result of that tragic passing. He was also a contemporary of the Ramchal, uh, Rabbi Moshe Chaim Lutzato. So here he was in, in, in Italy. And to, to, to really understand why he wrote this book, we've got to turn the clock back. He started writing this book at, in, at, uh, in 1725. We've got to roll the, black, the, the clock back around 10, 12 years or so. Uh, he had an encounter with... Uh, uh, a very interesting person, or a notoriously interesting person, somebody called Nehemia Chia Chayon. Say that fast ten times. Nehemia Chia Chayon. So this Chayon character turned up on the scene in his home in in Ravergus's hometown, mm -hmm. and masqueraded as a a rabbi of note, a kabbalist of note. And he became, he started teaching Torah. Now, it didn't take very long. Rabbi Ergas, Rabbi Ergas was a, a genius, and it didn't take very long for him to uncover and really reveal the true intentions of this, uh, this Chayun. 
And he discovered uh, in, in discussions with him and looking at the books that he was presenting, he was well versed enough in all of what was going on in his times to identify that this person was an out, the Chayon was an out and out follower of the Shabtai Tzvi, a Sabbatean. Now, just to uh, roll the, back, the clock back a little bit further, Shabtai Tzvi came on the scene big time at around 1650, that's when he really hit the scene. And he, uh, he, he was a, a very, uh, a, a, he was a very charismatic individual who took Kabbalah and used it in a practical way. And he, because through his character, he was able to convince many uh, genuine rabbis that he, he was the real thing. Mm -hmm. And he built up this whole messianic movement around himself. And uh, he was a false messiah, just for those who were false, He was a false right. messiah, but at the time, people thought that he really was the messiah. Mm -hmm. And he managed to attract to him thousands of people. And ultimately, ultimately, his end was that, uh, uh, without going into the details of his story, his end was that he was offered by uh, the Sultan uh, whether he should, uh, uh, two options, either he converts to Islam or they chop his head off and he decided he was very attached to his head and he <laughs> converted to Islam and then uh, people realized that he wasn't the Messiah. However, even though he, he wasn't the Messiah, nevertheless, he started off this movement, which from 1650 until, would you believe it, 1800, managed to attract tens, if not hundreds of thousands of Jews away from authentic Judaism. And the basis upon which it, it was doing so was the attraction to uh, distortions of Kabbalah, uh, just bending, bending Torah practices out of all proportion in order to uh, focus on Kabbalistic idealism, which was just taken out completely out of context. And this Nehemiah Chia Chayim, this Chayim character, was one of those followers and was one of those one of the more prominent of the followers of the Shabtai Tzvi in, in in certainly in the times of Rabbi Ergas. So imagine the scene: Rabbi Ergas has just unearthed this individual of, of Chayon, and what happened in, in in that time was they, they didn't have televised debates like we do today for uh, presidential debates or anything like that. They they used to write books. So they had they wrote books against each other and they had a, a vitriolic slanging match, writing books one after the other. And Rabbi Ergas wrote two very, very strong polemic books called Tochachat Megula and Hatzad Nachash against Chayun. And they were both published in 1715. And in Tochachat Megula, Rabbi Ergas writes, he writes that one day, I hope, he says, to put the record straight, and I'm going to explain, and he listed a whole string of different Kabbalistic concepts, so that students, future students of Kabbalah should not be put off and misunderstand them and take these ideas out of context and, and, bend, and just bend things out of context and distort Jewish practice as a result of it. And that, that wish, that desire, that prayer, if you wish, that he wrote down in Tochachat Megula was ultimately realized 10 years later when he started writing his book Shomer Emunim in the book Shomer Emunim itself. Unfortunately, he, he lived long enough to complete the book. So that was one reason why Rabbi, Rabbi Ergas wrote the book itself. The so, second... so in many ways, although it's not written towards those who followed uh, this character, Fundamentally, it's a defense of and a rebuttal to those who have misrepresented uh, Kabbalah, and it's a way to present an authentic, uh, non Sabbatean understanding of, you know, theoretical and perhaps even aspects of practical Kabbalah, which uh, in this time and this place had really been uh, taken totally out of context and lured so many people to follow, you know, incorrect leaders and go off in the wrong direction. Absolutely. And in particular, what the Shabtai Tzvi did was he, he, he physicalized God. And with this book, Shomer Emunim, 
with this book Shomer Emonim, his the intention was to set Rabbi Elkas's, uh, intention was to set the record straight mm -hmm. and to distance any potential student of Kabbalah from any possibility of physical physicalizing God, God forbid, I should add. So this was a primary reason to write the book. However, there was another reason, because with all this noise around Shabbat Tzvi, there were many in or many followers of authentic Judaism, of Talmudic Judaism, who sat, who, who, who sat up. They noticed what was going on. It was, very, it was impossible not to notice what was going on. And they started asking questions about Kabbalah. And they started asking, what is all this Kabbalah stuff anyway? We can be a good Jew. You can just do Tariag mitzvahs, 630 mitzvah, perform them, catch yourself to God, you can be a good Jew, you don't need this Kabbalah stuff at all. And so Rabbi Ergas is also writing to this backlash, to, to uh, meet this backlash from the Talmudic community to explain exactly where, um, where um, Kabbalah fits in with, in Judaism. And he, and he devotes the beginning of, certainly the beginning of his work to the concept of the authenticity of Kabbalah, and more than that, he structures his work as a conversation between two people. Mm -hmm. Somebody, one person, person number one is Sha'al Tiel. It's a conversation, questions and answers. The person who's asking is called Sha'al Tiel, which means the person, the one I'm asking of God, the person who's asking of God, and the answers are given by a character called Yeho Yada, the one who knows God, the Kabbalist. So, the, the entire book is structured as a discussion between the skeptical Talmudist and the and we see as the book moves uh, moves on that how the the uh, Kabbalist convinces the skeptical Talmudist that there is indeed a, a genuine tradition of Kabbalah, and uh, so on top of this, on top of this, we the the way in which Rabbi Ergus expresses himself is just, uh, he's just got such a clarity. The beauty of his expression and he structures his questions and answers in a very deliberate way, building up ideas all the way through through the work of Shomer and Monim, and also contrasting Kabbalistic concepts with basic concepts in Jewish philosophy. And in doing so, he builds up a very wholesome work in its own right. And I, I saw this book, I, I was in the middle of this discussion, this learned discussion, and I saw this book, I went, went right through this book, it was a tangential to that discussion, but I, I couldn't help but notice at that point when I was in that vacuum after the Nefesh Simpson project, how beautiful this book was and how many different concerns it addresses. And it also explains basic Kabbalistic ideas in a way that other Kabbalistic works just don't do. And I felt uh, most Kabbalistic works are cryptic to the core. And this was deliberately explaining ideas so people would not come to make the same errors that the Sabbateans did. So it then became utterly obvious that this book had to be my next project. Wow. Really, firstly, thank you for giving that context for helping us understand where the Shomer Ronin came, came and what Rabbi Ergas is trying to do in this book. I want to use a kind of a strange term, and not that Rabbi Ergas needs kind of to be compared to more modern uh, scholars, but it's as if you've described him as like the Arya Kaplan of his time, really responding to different trends and trying to say, I need to give some explanations here that are totally rooted in the tradition knowing full well that they're being misunderstood and misrepresented uh, by different camps, as you say, the Sabbateans in one instance, and also those who seem to be more dismissive of the mystical tradition in another. And so he produced this elegant, uh, and I think that's a key word here, elegant work, which moved you when you encountered it, which has led you to invest, I presume, some years in your study, in your commentary, in your research, and in your writing. So moving on, uh, a point made by Rabbi Ergas, and I've had obviously a chance to, to read through your translation, your commentary, and those incredible essays, the introduction and the Kabbalah overview. But a point made by Rabbi Ergas 
and are repeated by later scholars, which you emphasize in your introduction, is how it's crucial to have a working knowledge of what we may call Kabbalah to fulfill the mitzvot. Can you explain this point further while also addressing why many people still nowadays are skeptical about mystical teachings and the study of mysticism? Right, well, that's a very interesting question. So I want to emphasize your question, if I may. And uh, so Rabbi Ergas in Shomer Monim, he, uh, he says it even more strongly. He says, it's absolutely incumbent upon every Torah scholar to study Kab Kabbalah. Mm -hmm. And if, if we actually look at the, the works of the, the Gra, the, Gra, the Vilna Gaon, the Balatanya, the Alta Rebbe, and the Ramchal, they all advocate, um, the, Gra, the, Gra, the, the Vilna Gaon advocates learning all of Torah. You can spend your entire life just learning uh, Humash and Mephoroshim on it, just the, the, the just the Torah and the commentaries on the Torah, you can spend your entire life on it. But we have a we have a, a mitzvah to learn all of Torah, and that also includes the uh, the Kabbalah. And in our general curriculum, the Balatanya, the Alter Rebbe, and also the Ramchal in a Ramchal in, a, in an essay called Derech Chochma, they chart out what should be the curriculum for uh, a person who's a, a, a mature student who's coming to start learning Torah. And they mm -hmm. include a component of a Kabbalah, even for such a student. Of course, the component to begin with starts off relatively small, but as one advances in one's Torah knowledge, eventually the, the, the Kabbalah side of study needs to become the major focus of every person's study. And in particular, for uh, when one becomes a Torah scholar, one, it is, as Rabbi Yoga says, and I mentioned, it's incumbent upon such a person to to study Kabbalah. And I, and I think to really answer this question properly, we've got, to, we've got to ask the question, well, okay, what is Kabbalah? So uh, there are so many misconceptions about what, what Kabbalah is. Many, uh, many associate Kabbalah with all sorts of apocryphal supernatural acts that probably didn't happen. They, everyone's heard, I would have thought, of the Golem of Prague. And would it be a surprise to learn that the Golem of Prague was, it, it was a fabrication. There was somebody called Rabbi Yudel Rosenberg who wrote a kid's book, but it's a long story. It never happened. It was a nice story, but it never actually happened. And most people associate Kabbalah with acts of Kabbalah. And, but, that's certainly not where I'm at. And uh, the, uh, there are many who also relate to Kabbalah as a form of meditation and ultimately prayer. And the truth is we cannot understand Jewish prayer properly unless uh, we understand Kabbalah. And when we're talking about the names of God and what each different name means and how when we are relating to God through prayer, uh, what the, those names, what we should have in mind when we're thinking those names and how we should relate to God. It is a meditation. But let's put that aside. First and foremost, beyond anything else, Kabbalah is simply the deepest level of Torah study. Mm -hmm. It's the deepest level and understanding of the Torah. And also, it's the deepest level of understanding of God and how God interfaces with us. God is primary. There are many people out there who learn Torah all day long and they don't mention the word God. When we learn Kabbalah, it's all about God. The Torah is God's Torah. When we learn the Torah, we're attaching ourselves to God. And we have to understand, the deeper we understand the Torah, the deeper we understand what God is. And therefore, we understand what we are. And therefore, it also allows us to significantly enhance our own performance of, of God's mitzvot, of God's commandments to us. Now, I'll give you an example. I'll give you an example. When we say, we have a mitzvah, a say, the writer, a positive Torah commandment to recite, to recite Shema Yisrael. Mm -hmm. Everyone knows it. It's on all of our lips. Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad, Yukei Vavke Elokeinu Yukei Vavke Echad. Now we recite this in the morning, recite it in the evening, and uh, we learn from Gemara Brachas with Rabbi Akiva, the last thing on his lips before he passed away was the Echad. 
and we, we recite this before we pass away. This is so important to a Jew, it's got to be on our minds all day long. Bam, we say in the middle of the Shema. We, this is what we've got to talk about. This is all, this is going to be on our minds all the time. We have a mitzvah. There are, there are six mitzvahs, mitzvahs which the, the Sefer HaChinuch highlights are uh, mitzvahs to Midias. They are, mitz, they are commandments that every Jew is, has to perform and at all times. Yes. And one of them is understanding what it means when we say Shema Yisrael, internalize Israel. We we have to internalize that Yukevavke, who, who is our Elokeinu, that Yukevavke is Echad, is one. What does one mean? What does it mean? How can we internalize it if we don't understand what one means? Hmm. And how, and what's this verse talking about? What is Yukevavke and what is Elokeinu? There's an equation going on here. Yukevavke A equals Elokeinu, and that Yukevavke is one. Now, we need to know Kabbalah in order to understand, even begin to understand what this most primary statement, this primary mitzvah, and everybody agrees that whether we have to, whether mitzvah, whether commandments require Kabbalah, intention or not, everybody agrees that this first line of the, the Shema requires intention when we actually recite it in order to perform the mitzvah, in order to actually fulfill this commandment uh, properly. In order to fulfill the commandment, period, mm -hmm. we have to have intention, a proper intention. So what does it mean? Does it, without Kabbalah, we don't know what Echad means. Without Kabbalah, we don't know what it means when we're saying Yuke Vavke equals Elohim. We're equating something. We're saying that they are the same thing. And this, co this concept of Yuke Vavke is one. Now, well, just, to, I, just, to, I, just to add, add an example to this, I mean, the Shema obviously is the ultimate example. But as you well know, um, right, right at the end of the Tefillah, we're, we're recording mid Av, uh, you know, we're soon about to enter Chodesh Elul, and right at the end of the Tefillot of Yom Kippur, the Kila community is asked to cry, Yud Kei Vav Kei Hu Elokim. We do so um, a number of times. Now, firstly, the idea of repetition is itself Kabbalistically significant, but as you say, there is this is a theological statement. So a person who doesn't understand this is just counting their fingers, kind of they're saying, because I've got some food that I'm really hungry to have. When you understand, even on the most basic of levels, what is being expressed there, it's it's an expression of that unity. That is, after a day of fasting and prayer, you're basically saying to God, I get it. <laughs> yeah. And the, and that, the sad that, fact is, people are screaming it out it. and they don't get it. They don't get what they're saying. That's it. The zenith of Yom Kippur. We're making that equation. We're stating that equation. Right. I should just flesh it out a tiny little bit and just say, very high level what these concepts are but uh, I'm, I'm going to get into them and, and clearly that they, they these concepts need a, a serious attention in their own right but UK Vavke is the god that I don't see the god that transcends everything and Elohim is the god that is manifest within everything that I do relate to and in, in other words the natural world around me and that, by the way, is why the gematria of Elohim is the gematria of Hateva, which is 86. So we're making an equation. We're saying, even though I don't see God around me, I understand that everything is, is penetrated. And uh, to the nth degree, to the ultimate degree, by UK Vavke, that God that, I, I, that transcends me. And, and then that, that, that's the equation we're making. UK Vavke equals Elohim. And that UK Vavke is one. And when we say one, we're not saying one as opposed to two, as opposed to three. We're saying one, everything. And to understand that properly, we need to get into the idea of unity. And that's discussed in, in quite a lot of detail in Shomer and Munin. So uh, I, I'll leave it there for the moment. Otherwise, we can spend uh, we can spend a very long time. You could. I was just thinking. I was thinking about that famous speech of Chacham Nieto when he talked about you know, God is nature, and the famous letters written to Chacham Tzvi, uh, and that, and part of it is the accusation of him being a pantheist, but fundamentally, how we see the what is God, and a Kabbalistic understanding of God is to say, uh, God is everywhere, God is everything, and, um, uh, but in a deep way, not in a, you know, a thoughtless way, in a profound way, and understanding how that, as you say, manifests itself. So, uh, now, beautiful. Yes, yeah, sorry. 
Okay, so um, so now 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 that we've defined what Kabbalah is, it's the deepest part of the Torah. We we can now um, address the skept- those who are skeptical about about what you call mystical teachings. Mm-hmm. So the skepticism, and so broadly speaking, yes, the the the, the, the skepticism. So. So where, where does it come from? Okay, so we've got to talk about the the pedigree of Kabbalah. Where does Kabbalah come from? It's all right. It's all very well me coming along and say yes, Kabbalah is the deepest part of the Torah, and 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 illustrating it with all sorts of examples. Yes, I can do that. But at the end of the day, where does Kabbalah actually come from? Now, what what every Kabbalist is coming along and saying is that Kabbalah is part of the Torah. It's part and parcel of the Torah. It's not different from any other part of the Torah, and it was received by Moshe. Rabbeinu at Har Sinai. It was received at Sinai. And there are various parts of the Torah. You've got the Torah Shebich Sav, you've got the written Torah, the, the Torah Shebich Al Peh, the, uh, the oral Torah, you've got the Halacha the Moshe Misinai, which is also part of the oral Torah. And you've got this Kabbalah thing, which is also part of the oral Torah, except there is one difference between the Kabbalah and the rest, all the other parts of, Torah, of the Torah. All the other parts of the Torah came down through the ages, was passed down through the entirety of Am Yisrael. So the Torah was given to all of Am Yisrael. All, mm-hmm. The Torah Shebich Sav, the written Torah, was given to all of the, all of the Jewish people in the wilderness. The, uh, the oral Torah was given over to the entirety of the Jewish people. And it was passed down through the entirety of the Jewish people in each and every generation all the way down to us today. In great contrast to that, the Kabbalah was not passed down to everybody it was only passed down it was passed down through the generations but it was only passed down to the elite uh, of each generation and even then not all the elite and it may have even been just one or two people in a particular generation where the Kabbalistic tradition passed down and as a result of that one can therefore question seriously question what is the authenticity of the Kabbalah? It's one thing to pass the tradition of Judaism from parent to child, all the way down from Har Sinai down to us, through the entirety of the Jewish people that who te- all testify to this, this receipt of the Torah. And the it's another thing to say, well, every now and again, you've got a book, a Kabbalistic work that surfaces, like mm-hmm. the Zohar, that's out the blue suddenly surfaces and where did that come from? And uh, where, where you've got these um, Kabbalistic ideas that suddenly surface from time to time, and and there's this claim of a received tradition down a uh, a uh, unique line of great rabbis. And even so, not all of those, not all the rabbis you would have thought would have been great Kabbalists were. So, for example. Rambam, Maimonides, mm. was not part of this Kabbalistic tradition. It sounds incredible in the, as a statement to make such a statement. And Rabbi Ergas in Shomer Emunim explains that Ramba, the Rambam, Maimonides, was not a recipient of this tradition. And he discusses the details of how can that be, etc., etc. Uh, but he does highlight that you've got many other, whole slew of other rabbis who were part of this tradition. So you've got the, the Ramban, the Ritva, the Rashba, the Raivad, and, and, and there's a very, very long list of esteemed rabbis in the, uh, who, who, who were part of this rabbinic uh, tradition of who received the Kabbalah all the way through the ages. So, and then as I mentioned, the Zohar, that the thing about the Zohar was that it suddenly surfaced in the 13th century, and ostensibly it was supposed to be the uh, the, the work of the work of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. Well, no one actually claims mm-hmm. that he wrote it. It is his teachings um, passed down the generations. But in the Zohar itself, there are many place names and people's names that that were relatively con- contemporary and didn't exist in the time of the of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. So many things got added into the Zohar, and there's, it, 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 was, it was a text that uh, had been copied and recopied and copied and copied and copied, and many people had entered in additional, shall we say, dross into, mm-hmm. the, 
into the uh, the core. And ultimately, there is a core there that is a genuine Kabbalistic tradition that was passed down to Rabbi, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. But there were many additional, la many layers of additional coatings that were added on. And uh, it takes a great Kabbalist to be able to to look at the Zohar and understand which bits are the real are the real McCoy and which bits are the additional the additional um, the additional bits and pieces, some layers, of which, the additional are, layers, which, which have, yeah. additional layers, and some of those layers are, are genuine because they may have been additional um, correct glosses written by Kabbalists who had received the tradition, and those glosses got entered into the core text with with manuscript um, copying, um, and some of those glosses were just simply plain wrong. So. Uh, there is that component as well, and there are many who are who are skeptical of the Kabbali of the Kabbalistic tradition in general, who have got much to query, genuinely query about the authenticity of the Zohar. And in and in addition, you also have this uh, all the way through the ages, and uh, of course the Sabbateans, and there are so many people today. The world is. It's just, it's unfortunately, it's prolific. The the number of people who are taking Kabbalah and bending basic ideas, turning it into psychology or or pop culture or whatever, they're taking Kabbalah out of context and they're bending these ideas and, and still today distorting these ideas and distracting people, and disconnecting them. And the worst thing of all, disconnecting Kabbalah from authentic, genuine Torah. And mitzvahs. Torah mitzvahs, not to, you should distinguish, but when we think of Torah, it's important to say, you know, people who say, I study Kabbalah, and I say, well, what were the mitzvahs that the Kabbalah comes to explain and certainly expect? And if people think that that's optional. They, it's already a very, very significant red flag. Absolutely. So if somebody is studying Kabbalah and is disconnected from actually performing the, the mitzvah to the Torah, Unfortunately, the Kabbalah they're studying is it just cannot be authentic. Uh, real Torah-based Kabbalah is is supported by it's supported by all of the rabbanim of uh, of the last several generations of note, and ever since Kabbalah got into the open forum, uh, the all the rabbanim, the, the the famous Ashkenazi rabbanim, the the Lithuanian rabbanim, the Vilna Gaon, and and all of the uh, all of his followings, the Hasidim. Uh, the Baal Shem Tov and all of the followers of the Baal Shem Tov and all of the Svardi greats, almost all, almost, almost all Rabbanim have, have all added their uh, comments, either commentaries, Kabbalistic commentaries, or written Kabbalistic works themselves. And you even got people like the, the Rabbi Yosef Cairo, who wrote the Shulchan Aruch, and the Rabbi, Rabbi Moshe Isselis, who wrote the Bloss on the, the Shulchan Aruch, they both relate, they, they both uh, wrote works which included Kabbalistic, either chapters or entire works which were, were Kabbalistic. Uh, and we cannot, t t today, it, it is, the, the Kabbalah is so integrated with with Torah um, and with all of these genuine um, Torah scholars and leaders of all these, all, all these several uh, uh, generations, past generations, that to to disconnect Kabbalah from Torah is to to really take away a part, is to deny mainstream Judaism basically. Uh, mm -hmm. If we're gonna, if we're gonna, if we're going to any any question mark over the authenticity of Kabbalah ultimately is in today's terms denying mainstream Judaism. But that doesn't mean we don't court the question and discuss and, and debate the issues that were genuine issues of authenticity, and they do require a proper airing and, uh, and proper discussion. So in addition to Rabbi Ergus's comments uh, that he uh, devotes to the authenticity of Kabbalah, I felt it was very important to bring those comments up to date and to add uh, in my introduction to the work, uh, a, a lengthy piece on the authenticity of Kabbalah itself. Mm -hmm. And you do a, a great job. So just to, just to summarize, because I, this is something which I've certainly encountered in many different ways. I, I don't know if you meant, I mentioned to you before, I did my rabbinical training in the Spanish and Portuguese community who historically had an immediate reaction, obviously, Sabbatean Judaism. So still in their Sidurim, they don't have Brich Shemek, uh, and things like that, because they say explicitly, this is because this is where we came from. And that's a historical reason, and they maintain that minhag, and that's understandable. But in terms of people for whom they're not coming from that context, 
this idea of being dismissive or or, or uh, marginalizing the contribution and substantiveness of Kabbalistic teachings and the necessity for them to live, as you say, a wholesome Jewish life and perform uh, mitzvot and to learn Torah in a deeper sense is itself absurd. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but absurd. Uh, I think in, in your safety, you quote Rabbi Ergas is saying, although I, I don't know whether it's somewhat being artistic in his reading, but nevertheless, his conclusion, he certainly believes that when, you know, the Gemara and Masechet uh, Shabbat that lists these six questions you're asked when you reach Shemaim, Nasata v'natata v'emunah, he says, emunah is, you know, the deepest interpretations of Torah is ultimately Kabbalah. Nasata v'natata v'emunah isn't just about did you do your business dealings, you know, faithfully. It's about whether you are faithful to the Torah in its, in its fullest sense, whether it was really taught Hashem to Mima, because only if it's Mima, as Chazal say, is it Mishivat Nafesh? Right. So I want to now ask you uh, what may well be a strange question, and apologies for doing that, uh, but it could well be a question that those watching this interview ask themselves. And uh, and I speak here as someone who more than once davened uh, in the Tivot by the Keva the Baba Sali, and I've uh, davened at Kevarim and numerous other Kubalim, I've uh, received brachot from various other great sages, including uh, Renan Makubalim, Rabbi Yaakov, Hillel, and others. And you don't look like a Kabbalist. <laughs> and notwithstanding the huge scholarship, uh, obviously, evident even just from this conversation and demonstrated in your Nefesh Simtum and in Shemayel Monim and the essays you've written and the commentaries you've penned, um, I don't even know whether you would necessarily classify yourself as a Kabbalist. Well, maybe you would. So what are you? You're an author, you're a scholar. That's without a question. What are you? Boy, what am I? <laughs> what are you? Your question utterly haunts me. <laughs> what are you? This is a question I wake up every morning. And I say, Moda ani lefanecha melechai v'kayam. I thank you, God, O living, o living God. I thank you. Who am I and who are you? Who's God? What am I? If I understand what God is, then maybe I understand what I am. But what am I? When I wake up in the morning and I try to understand that question, and I say, am I going to understand that question a little bit better today than I did yesterday? What am I? This is the question that I... I I've always got to have on my lips. What am I? Thank you so much for asking me this. No, I'm, ask, I'm asking it in a, in a foolish way yes, because I'm... it's about appearance. In a substantive way, I'm, I'm going to actually be bold enough to answer it because I'd hope to think that I endeavor to try and fit this, which is you're an ever the Shem. That, I, I believe that is who well, you are. And we've, we've corresponded, being in contact over the years about different things. And I, you're, you're a seeker, you're a searcher, you're an... Ever Hashem, that I think is what you mean when you say those words, unless I, well, I'm incorrect. Hashem, but in terms okay. of this look and this appearance, uh, you know, that's what I'm kind of throwing at you. It's about being a good Jew, which of course is an Ever Hashem. It, that's what am I? I'm aspiring. Everyone should be aspiring to be a good Jew and to have a better connection with our Kaddish Baruch Hu. And it's about our relationship with our Kaddish Baruch Hu, and only our relationship of, with our Kaddish Baruch Hu, that should frame the context um, that we have when we pray, whether it's at the grave of uh, a great person or whether we are, we are seeking a blessing from a great person. We, we can own the, the, the context of, of, of seeking out these bestowals, however they may come, should only ever be in the context of focusing directly on God and understanding what I am in connection with my relationship with God. And my connection, my relationship is with God. Mm. So that's the point. And um, after completing my Nefesh Hatzintun project, people came up to me and they asked me, you've done all this work, Rabbi Chaim Velozhen, Nefesh Achayim, translating, commenting on it and getting into this idea of Tzintun. Surely, surely you're going to go and visit Rabbi Chaim Velozhen's grave. They were very surprised by my answer. I answered them like this. 
the book Nefesh Achayim itself. Why is it called Nefesh Achayim? Well, the answer actually appears on the title page of Nefesh Achayim itself. It was posthumously, this name was posthumously as, ascri- assigned to the book by Rabbi Chaim Velozhin's son, Rabbi Yitzchakul of Velozhin. And he gives two reasons actually appearing on the title page as to why he gave that name of Nefesh Achayim. I'm going to focus on one of them. He quotes a Gemara from a Talmud Yerushalmi, and he says as follows. He quotes this Gemara. Ein osin the fashos latzadikim. Ein osin the fashos. We don't make the fashos. The fashos. What's a nefesh? In the lashon of Mishnah, nefesh is a is a gravestone. It's a memorial. We don't make memorials mm. for righteous people. Why? Shadivrehem ein zichronam. Because their words, their Torah, their teachings, their Torah teachings are their memory. And the memory of a righteous person is for a blessing. So why was the book Nefesh HaChaim called Nefesh HaChaim? Because this is the memorial for Chaim. It's the Nefesh, it's his Nefesh, it's his memorial. If I want to connect with Reb Chaim Velozhin, what good is it going to do to me to go to visit his grave? I should pick up his book and study his teachings. Shadivrehem heim zichronam. You know, by the way, uh, I'm presu- I say you know. You, I'm sure you know, but I'll just mention it to our listeners. Um, when it says in Perkevot, Rashi says, but for him, this can be done through books. And the Chidon, his commentary on Perkevot, basically describes how... Um, when you learn a sefer, it's as if you're learning with the author. So every single time you learn a sefer, you're having a chavrusa with the author. And that's a very, very palpable uh, idea. By the way, I should say further, it has a halachic dimension, because the Gemara says, principally, a person shouldn't study on their own. Rav Moshe Sternbuch in his Chuvot Ban Hagot says, yeah, that's when people didn't have svarim, but now you have svarim, you're never learning on your own, because you got the author as your chavrusa. And one of the I'm things all- I do on, on Sukkot you know, people often have pictures of tzaddikim. I say, that's not, I don't need a picture. I bring in this form, I learn them. The tzaddikim are with me. I don't need a picture of them. I want them to be present with me in my sukkah. If I bring the Igus Moshe, Rav Moshe is with me. And I bring the Nefesh Chaim, the Rav Chaim is with me. So, and the way we have guests for our sukkah is best done, uh, apart from obviously physically providing for physical guests. But uh, beyond that, it's to learn Torah, and those guests are there with you, learning with you teaching you and of course we have the famous Gemara that says um, when we're learning when we're learning the Torah of somebody if so submit over those for Keva their their their, their lips are uh, are explaining things in the Keva it's as if they are the, they're with well it says in the Keva but it's as if they yes. are actually learning it with you and in fact in, in, you animate them you're so. just reminding me now in, in Nefesh HaChaim itself uh, he, he brings down the Chazal that when we're learning through a sugya, HaKadosh Baruch Hu is talking with us, is repeating mm-hmm. the Torah that we're saying. So we've got mm-hmm. HaKadosh Baruch Hu with us as well. So mm-hmm. uh, why on earth am I going to go to Rav Chaim Volozhin's keva in order to attach myself to Rav Chaim Volozhin? I want to go further than that. And I'm going to use Rav Chaim Volozhin is certainly one of my primary Rebbe, so I'm going to use Rav Chaim Velozhin as the launching pad into the next point. Some people might find this controversial, um, but it's, I, I'm, it's not me, it's Rav Chaim Velozhin's Torah. So, and this, the basic idea actually is brought down in the Sefer called Keso Rosh, and uh, what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm going to take the basic idea and elaborate in the context of uh, Gomorrah and Shabbos. Uh, Shabbos Lamed Beis Amad Aleph it is. So, uh, goes like this. It's, a, it's an explanation, and I'm going to explain, I'm going to suggest an, an explanation, what the real explanation, I'm going to suggest what, the real explanation for, for performing kaparot. So that practice where we we, we, we uh, wave that chicken above our head before Yom Kippur, or wave the money above our head uh, before Yom Kippur. Why do we get involved in such a practice? It seems like a very strange practice. Why do we do it? And I believe the key to this practice is the last two verses of um, that paragraph that we recite, B'nai Adam Choshech B'Tzalmavis, just before we, we do the twirling bit, when we twirl the chicken or twirl the, uh, twirl the uh, money above our heads. 
And in that paragraph, the last two verses are two psukim, two verses from uh, Sefer Eo, from the book of Job. And that we say as follows. Im yesh alav malach melitz. If a person has above him a uh, an angel who is advocate. An angel advocate, yeah. So, echad mini aleph. One in a thousand. Lahagid adam yoshro to advocate positively about the person. Now, this is a very important pasuk. This is a very important verse, because it's the first time in the whole of Tanakh that we encounter the word, the term, Melitz Yosha. Melitz Yosha. So, and, and Melitz Yosha, a, a good advocate. Very often when we go to a, somebody's grave, we think that we want to talk to the person to be um, um, an advocate on our behalf. Where does, this, where does this term arise? It arises in this pasuk. What is the context of this pasuk? So we have to look at the Gemara in, in Shabbos. The Gemara in Shabbos explains that when we are standing in judgment, that we, we may have, wh- whatever we do, we can understand this from the Gemara, whatever we do creates something. Nothing happened. There's, we live in the world of action. Everything that we do, we perform something good. We do a mitzvah, we perform one of the commandments. We create what's called an angel. We create something. In other words, the angel is the positive effect of the positive action that we actually performed mm-hmm. in contrast when we if god forbid we were to create to perform something wrong to, to perform a sin we also create an angel but that angel doesn't speak favorably about us it's a prosecutor so we cause the problems that we have or we cause the good things that ultimately will happen to us in, in uh, in Olam Haba and Gan Eden and Olam Haba. So, Im Yesh Alav Malach Melitz, if we have just this one, Echad Mini Al Aleph, one in a thousand, I've got 999 of these prosecuting angels that I created. Why? How did I create them? Because of things that I did. And I've got one against those 999. I did something right. That, and that one is called the Melitz Yosha, as a result of my actions. Mm-hmm. Then the next Pasuk, and this is the final Pasuk that we recite there before the Kabarot, and we say, God is placated. And he says, This person is redeemed from going down into that pit, for going down into, into the bad place. Matsasi Kofar. I have found kapora, I found kofa, I found atonement. Kaporas are atonement. Why am I doing this mitzvah of kaporot? kaporot? Why? What am I going to do with this chicken when I throw it after I twirl it in my head? And there are many other reasons why we do kaporot, but I'm suggesting that this is the prime, the primary reason. What am I doing with this chicken? I'm going to give it to Tzedakah. I'm going to give it to charity. I'm going to feed a poor family. Or I'm going to give the money that I twirl over my head to charity. It goes to charity. And I get one last shot at doing something positive before Yom Kippur, before the Day of Atonement. So I'm doing this positive act. I may have 19, 999 negative acts against me, 999 voices against me, but I created at least one, this is my last chance, I'm just getting in there with one mitzvah, with one commandment, fulfilling one commandment before that big day of, of of atonement. I want to achieve atonement. I want to do that mitzvah. So when we understand that this is the real meaning of the term Melitz Yosha, when we go to a grave, how can it be that my dearly beloved departed departed um, beloved parent or sibling or Rebbe or whoever it is that I'm going to beseech to give me a blessing, how can they do anything for me? A Meditz Yosha is not that person. I can only generate a Meditz Yosha Mm. from my own actions. How can the dearly um, beloved departed be a Meditz Yosha for me? And there is a way that that person can be a a, a male at for me. If that person inspires me, if that person Mm. causes me to do a to do a mitzvah, to to perform a positive uh, perform a commandment, if that person inspires me to do good things, then that person is a true male at for me. But what do we learn from this piece of Torah? 
that can somebody, can a great rabbi go to visit that great rabbi? That person is great because I understand that person's greatness and therefore inspires me. And I've got a direct line with God. That person can only inspire me to speak directly to God. And we should never, God forbid, ever forget that our connection is to God. So we can go to visit graves to our heart's content. And there's possibly an Isodor if we beseech of the, of the departed to do something on our behalf. I, I believe that would be an Isodor even. Uh, a Torah Isodor, to, if, if I were to uh, uh, beseech such a thing. The, the only thing that I can do, and, and, and I should say that, that I'm, I'm not negating, Rav Chaim Velozhin isn't coming along to negate the practice of going to somebody's kever. There, there is, it's a Minag Yisrael, and it's brought down, let's say, in Sefer Hasidim, where, where he even says that people would go to visit, uh, people should, should, might want to go to people's graves or their dearly beloved departed, uh, because it somehow benefits the departed people uh, uh, when we go to visit the grave. And he also suggests that we can ask for them to, do, to pray to God on our behalf. Mm -hmm. Let's never forget, there's a fine line. If people, if we go to a cavern, if we go to a grave, we might think that oh, we might end up talking to the person themselves. Uh, no, 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 no. The, the, we, we talk to God. That's it. Mm -hmm. And if we are interested to see a whole discussion, a learned discussion about this, this, this the whole thing about being mishtatech, al kibrit tzadikim, etc., the, uh, the Gorn of um, Yechiel Michal uh, Tukachinsky in his Gesher HaChaim, he devotes a whole chapter in Chelet Beis, in the second, in the second volume, the um, to to this subject and bringing all the uh, the pro all the uh, the voices pro and against the actual practice of going to a person's grave. But at the end of the day, I don't think anyone would disagree that, the, that our contract is with God, and we we should only ever develop our relationship with God. And if a particular rebbe or teacher or parent or sibling or whoever it is inspires us, then be inspired. Use that inspiration, but our contract is with God. Now, that's as far as going to um, you, going, going to Kavarim are concerned. But what about brachas? What about brachas? Getting a bracha from a rebbe? Should I be doing that? Well, we have a famous Gemara that Al Tehi Birchas Hezio Kala We shouldn't. Uh, we should always be giving brachas to everybody. Everyone should give a blessing to everybody. It's a wonderful thing to give another Jew a blessing. It's a wonderful, a wonderful thing to give another person a blessing. Everybody should bless everybody. Everybody, and and it uh, it does wonderful things to everybody. It makes uh, not only does it make you feel good, but actually causes you to be good. And there's a whole whole the whole psychology behind it. We should be giving each other blessings. Should we be going to receive the blessing of uh, a godal? Now, there's no harm in it. It's a very good thing to have a blessing. However, it's this caveat. Who's my contract with? This godal? This great person? Or is it with God? And if we want a blessing, let's say, for, for Paranasa, for our, our income, and it seems to be a, 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 primary, uh, a primary need um, among so many people that they go and visit these, uh, these rab Rabbonim and they ask for a bracha for Paranasa. Who should we be asking upon? Uh, and there's all these segulas, all of these crazy ritual things that people do in order to, if I, if I hang myself upside down and touch my, my, uh, my left ear with my, uh, or with, which, whichever way around, with, with my, my other hand, then am, am I going to get a, 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 am I going to get a bracha for Panosa? No, none of these segulas are, are good. There is one segula. If we want a segula for Panosa, there, there is a genuine segula for Panosa. And it's a mitzvah aseidah araisa. When we fulfill the mitzvah aseidah araisa, the biblical commandment, when we fulfill it in say, reciting the, the birchas hamaz in the grace after meals, what do we say? We say, v'na al tatrichenu Hashem elokeinu. Please, God, I don't want to accept anything from anybody else except for you. That is the request for Paranossa. And that is a legitimate request. It's part of the performance of a mitzvah aseda araisa. Everyone should have kavona at that point to speak directly to God to ask for Paranossa, to ask that they should have a, a better income.
going to a Rebbe for a bracha, there's no harm in having a bracha. Any, anyone giving a bracha is a good thing. And a kalvachoma on a Rebbe and on, on a, very, a very special person, that, that, the, the bracha, it, it, it's a wonderful thing. But we must never forget, never lose touch with having our feet on the ground, that we ask HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Uh, mm-hmm. Our contract is with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Therefore, you ask me, what am I? <laughs> so, <laughs> what am I? If I am yes. a Kabbalist at all, I would call myself a rationalist Kabbalist. I actually took the word mystical out of my book. I, I took it out of my book. I made a conscious effort to remove the word it's mystical from my book. And one of the approbations, one of my Haskamas actually wrote the word twice in his Haskama. And I, I asked him to please, please, I've taken this word out of my book. Please, can you take, can I, can I have your permission to take this word out of your, your approbation? And thank God, he very kindly ag- agreed. Baruch Hashem. So, uh, what's wrong, book, one second, what's wrong with the word? I mean, is it, uh, is it a misleading it, word? I think it's misleading. I think it's, uh, there's nothing wrong with the word per se, but it's, it's used by many people in today's generation to relate to something wacky and way out, out there. Mystical is the mystique, something that we don't understand. Oh, I'm going to uh, do voodoo on you uh, with these things mm. that you don't understand. And, and therefore, and therefore you're going to pay a lot of money to me. Well, there are charlatans <laughs> out there. And they give the word mystical perhaps a bad name. So mm. I, I took the word out of, of my, uh, and, and the word mystical is, is pitched against the word rational. I don't see myself as anything apart from rational. So as I said, I, what am I? I'm a person who's trying to connect with God on a deeper and better level every day. And I would call that being a rational Kabbalist. That's really <laughs> fascinating. And uh, wow, we touched on a whole bunch of things. Just a complete, complete aside, last week I was at a conference where Rabbi Leza Malamed gave an interesting talk about his Dach Psika. I haven't met him before. And my want is to, again, to, I believe it's, as you say, beneficial to get brachas. So I went up to him. So what did he say? He said, I bless you that God fulfills all the brachas he says to you in the Torah. I said, that's a good bracha. <laughs> that's the, meaning what he's simply saying is, I bless you that God does what God hopes to bless you with. But, you know, God hopes that God says he'll bless you with. Uh, and and I walked away thinking, wow, is that, that's actually, yeah, that's the, one of the most authentic brachas I've ever received because there's a humility in recognizing what we can do. And what we can do is, Will and pray that Kodesh Baruch Hu does that, but as you say, being God centered. Um, okay, I'm aware of time, so I, I, I'm just a slightly greater pace. I want to um, ask you the following Within your commentary and explanatory essays of Shomer Ronim, you often employ modern analogies, uh, such as movie theaters or referring to quarks. Is this done purely for pedagogic purposes? Or are you making a deeper point about the relevance of, I said, I've written down mystical teachings, I'll replace it as Kabbalistic teachings <laughs> to the modern world. Okay, so analogies, right. Well, you use as if to say, um, okay, let's, let's, let's be, explain the question behind the question. I think you're making a point in your, uh, uh, in your commentary and especially in the essays, <clears throat> there's something significant happening as we understand uh, more of our world and as technology progresses. So I believe, I'll, I'll kind of half answer your question. I don't think you're just simply giving useful analogies. I think you're, you're saying something significant by deliberately making reference to modern development in a commentary of this beautiful and elegant sacred work. So, but I'd, I'd love to hear more about it. Okay, well, I have to say you're right. <laughs> So, yes, I do. Well, I, have, I have love what you've written. I mean, I'm not coming from I, a completely I, empty space. I, I, do, I do use analogies to pedagogically to, to hopefully uh, uh, en- enlighten the, the topics that I'm, uh, to give light, to shed light on the topics that I'm actually describing. But the, there is a much deeper side to the, uh, the concept of the Kabbalistic analogy in particular. And uh, the, the 
there's license to do this because there's a, a basic Kabbalistic principle that, okay, we are here in the lowest realm, and I don't want to get into what are the higher realms, etc., and the lowest realm, but we are in the lowest realm. And, and we have to, uh, the Kabbalistic principle is that everything that happens in every realm, all the way up the chain, up until the essence of God, is reflected at every level, all the way down the chain, is, and is also reflected in our level, in our world around us, mm -hmm. and in some sort of abstract way. So we we are, the way we relate to things is, it's like nothing compared to, the, we have to abstract our thoughts in order to be able to relate to anything. We can't relate to anything higher than the level that we're in. We just can't. We, we can only relate to the physical world. No one can relate to anything outside of this physical world. And not in a real way. And the... Uh, we we can we can only do it by using analogies that we have within the context of this world. But nevertheless, what what's going on in the context of this world is, in some sort of abstracted way, a uh, a mirror of what happens in the higher worlds. And therefore, that gives us license to use these analogies in perhaps a more meaningful way than just in a pedagogical style to illustrate and illuminate ideas. And I guess we can think of this in the terms of like the difference between the realms in terms of uh, let's use an, an analogy. Let's use an analogy for data for data. <laughs> so um, I've got data. I store the data on a hard drive. I've got this physical thing. It's a hard drive and it contains this thing called data. Now, the DNA, for example, contains a huge amount of data. The DNA is a physical strand, a double helix. That can that because of its structure, etc., it contains a certain amount of information, and that's data. Now, the concept of data relative to the phys what we would call standard regular physicality, of course, from our perspective, data is also physicality, it's just very abstracted. So you've got this idea, this abstract idea of data, and then you have the physicality. You've got the data and you've got the DNA strands. So the uh, when we're talking about this world, we're talking about in we're talking about it in terms of DNA strands. But when we when we want to refer to the higher worlds, we can refer to it as some sort of abstracted level of data. So there is a license to do that, but there's more than that. There's more than that. The Vilna Gaon, and I write about this in actually volume two of Nefesh Ad Simpson, the Vilna Gaon, through five separate independent streams of his students' writings, right, um, explains that in order to understand the deepest part of Torah, in order to understand the Kabbalah, we have to have an understanding of science. Now, this was actually expressed, I'll, I'll, I'll share one of the, uh, one of the uh, students with you. It was his grandson, Rabbi Yaakov Moshe, son of Rav Abraham, the son of the Gra, son of the Vilna Gaon. Rabbi Yaakov Moshe wrote the second introduction to a book called Ayil Mushulash. Now, Ayil Mushulash is a very interesting book which was written directly by the Vilna Gaon. It's a mm -hmm. math book. It's a math book, a basic math book. And Rabbi Yaakov Moshe, his grandson, who's, who's involved in the publication of this work, is explaining, basically explaining, how can it be that Vilna Gaon's writing a math book? Where does that come from? And he explains, and he, he uses an, uh, an analogy of a ladder. He says, in order to get up the rungs of the ladder, you have to start on the first rung. What's he mm -hmm. saying? He's saying that in order to understand the Torah properly, in order to understand if we want to get up to the heady heights of the deepest parts of Torah, we've got to understand what's going on in this world around us. We've got to understand how this world works. If we don't understand how this world works, we haven't got a hope of going up another rung in the ladder. That's the Vilna Gaon. But even more significantly, though, even more significantly than that, we can look at pretty much all the rabbis throughout history. And when we look at rabbis throughout history, they always used contemporary science of their day to illustrate the ideas that they were trying to dispense. All that they explain, always, all, all the way through history. And in particular, whenever we look at Kabbalistic texts, whenever we look at Kabbalistic texts, we, all, we always see the hallmark of the usage of the contemporary science of the day. Mm -hmm. And um, the, Ramchal, the Ramchal writes in his Ma'amar al Agadot. Now, he explain, well, there are various people who explain that when we have the Agadah, the, the story narrative inside the Talmud, 
the story narrative inside the Talmud often seems very, very cryptic. And the Ramchal explains that uh, were the and and the the authors of the Talmud, the the people making the statements in the uh, the Agadic parts of the Talmud, are very often using contemporary idiom. Well, they are always using contemporary idiom and contemporary ideas. And the Ramchal says the following: He said, if those rabbis explaining these deep ideas in the Agada and then and the story narrative of the Talmud were to have lived in later times, they would have explained things in different ways because they would have understood the contemporary. Their, their understanding of contemporary science would have been more developed and they would have been able to explain things better. So Ram Hal says this himself. And also we see uh, people like the Balatanya, the Alter Rebbe, and also the Gra, they both say that the, uh, the, the story narrative, the Agada of the Talmud, contains, contains these deep uh, Kabbalistic ideas. Mm -hmm. So let's give you a few examples of, of, of contemporary science that has has been used over the years, and then we've got to go back in history. And there's a uh, the, you've got the four elements, for example, you've got earth, fire, wind, and water. The four the famous four elements that uh, come from Greek philosophy, and they they find themselves in rabbinic literature all the way through. Oh, you've got indeed. the Rishonim, the, you've got a whole slew of Rishonim, including the Rambam. Including Maimonides and a whole slew of other Rishonim, but take the puzzle, the Haaretz Haita, Haisa Tova, Vova, Hoshechal Penita, home, the second verse of the beginning, at the beginning of the creation story. And they they seem to load, they connect it with these four elements. Now, there is a kosher way of saying it that is even relevant today. Of course, we know that there are much, many, there are many more than four elements, or there are underlying elements to those elements. Uh, we, nowadays, we will talk about the underlying elements being quarks or theoretically maybe strings, but <clears throat> we we can relate to it in a positive way. We can say the those four elements were solid, liquid, gas, and energy, corresponding to earth, water, mm -hmm. um, air, and fire. <coughs> Excuse me. So, our rabbis through the generations have always used the contemporary science of their day in order to explain the. Uh, better explain the Torah. And you see this with also other other Greek philosophical ideas like the four levels of life, the domain tomer, chai, medabe, inanimate, plant life, animal life, and uh, human life. And then you've got other ideas like the sefirot. There's this thing in Kabbalah um, called the sefirot. And without going into it now, where does the, how, how is the idea presented Mm -hmm. Where does the word and and a, that's a plural? The word sefira in the singular it's sefira. Where does the word where does the word sphera come from? It comes from the Greek sphera. It means a sphere, because mm -hmm. that was the uh, the geocentric model of the universe was had concentric spheres, and that is one of the ways in explaining the relationship between certain sefira kabbalistically. So these analogies were used all the way through history all the way through history in order to explain Kabbalah and also in order to explain the Torah as well. Now, what I'm doing is no different, but there is, well, in principle, but there is one difference. The difference isn't because of what I'm doing. The difference is because of what's happening in the world. You see, for most of rabbinic history, nothing much changed. For the best part of 2,000 years, more or less, science was static. There weren't any new fundamental theories of the world. There were, there were several major advancements at the different points in time. But you had the basic ideas were, were set in stone for the best part of 2,000 years. And all of a sudden, for the last, you, you can debate this and discuss this, but let's say for the last uh, 150 years or whatever, uh, maybe a bit longer, maybe a bit shorter, we, we've had the, the openings of revolution in in scientific understanding and and it's been accelerating and accelerating and we we, we just have to look around the world the world the world around us and we see the technological uh, advancement within the in, uh, across the world around us it's quite remarkable to see what's happening we're living we're living in the times of the the digital transformation everything is dramatically changing and so what i'm doing is no different except I'm writing at a time 
where we are subject to such an incredible amount of change in the world around us. And just, I don't want, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just uh, hanging on the coattails of so many uh, giants from previous generations, but I'm just following their, all I'm doing in my book is following their lead and I'm taking the contemporary science of today and I'm asking, how does this relate? How can we understand the Torah in the context of contemporary science? That's all I'm doing. And, and the license to do so is also the Zara talks about it. It talks about the famous piece in the Zara that talks about from 1840 onwards, roughly, from 1840 onwards, the, uh, the uh, wellsprings of, of knowledge will open as a higher wellspring of Kabbalistic knowledge and a lower wellspring corresponding it of scientific knowledge. So science is, in this world, is the portal, is the the means, the mechanism gives us the language and gives us the, the framework of understanding of higher, deeper and more abstract ideas. And, and it, what, what's remarkable is that as science is developing, at least, at least some of the emerging contemporary science is providing real and accessible models for understanding deeper, deeper capitalistic ideas. And um, to the best of my, my ability, I have taken these ideas and explained them in a real way in my book, bringing sources, mm -hmm. Kabbalistic sources, basing myself properly on Kabbalistic sources, and equally bringing scientific sources and properly grounding the ideas in science as well. I'm not coming up with any voodoo, no hocus pocus, none of that. And I know that what I'm doing is only the beginning. Wow. So thank you for that. And, and, and I know, you know, it's really quite remarkable. and It's very evident in your book. And it's why not just from our own name as a Sefo, but your introductory essay and your 300 page uh, Kabbalah overview, which you can get to in a second, is so stimulating it because it's it contains things you wouldn't necessarily expect in a work like that. And that on that point. So I mentioned this Kabbalah overview a few times and it contains essays about a range of what I would say un not understood or misunderstood or misrepresented concepts, uh, world souls and how to relate to them, the Messiah's identity. Uh, can you, and I know, you know in a relatively uh, short period of time, can you pick one of those and perhaps explain as best you can what they mean and perhaps what you've tried to do in trying to make sense of what they mean right um well that's a pretty tall ask and i'm going to try to to get it down into a small period of time but we'll see let's let try so um so the kabbalah overview uh, sequentially builds up ideas of the arizal's kabbalah lurianic kabbalah and explains them in the context of contemporary science. Now, to do justice to any one of these ideas, one would have to have the proper buildup. But what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take perhaps the most important teaching of the Arizal's Kabbalah, and that is the, the concept of something called Pautzuf, Pautzufim, mm -hmm. and explain that. But in, in order to do that, I've also got to touch on, and I'm just gonna barely touch on these ideas of Pautzuf, and I've also got to touch on this idea of Sefirot. Okay. So here goes. What yes. what is this concept, and what and what does it mean to us? So the word partsof in Hebrew means face. Mm -hmm. You're looking at my face, and my face contains various bits and pieces. You've got my eyes, my nose, my mouth, my ears, my cheeks, my and etc. etc. If I were to take all these bits and pieces of my face and lay them out on the table in front of us, it would be quite gruesome. Yes, I know, but. There would be, what would we have? Would we have a face? No. We would have several body parts. Mm -hmm. If I take these several body parts and I configure them in a particular configuration of a face, then what happens is all those parts are still there. Those separate individual parts are still identifiable. You can still see, still see my eyes, my nose, my mouth, my cheeks, my ears, etc. But what emerges from this is that the whole of the face is greater than the sum of the parts. Right. There is an, an additional set of properties, call it, you might want to go as far as calling it consciousness, that there's something that emerges. When we put all these bits and pieces together, the face then becomes a portal into my personal being. 
So the face is the paratsuf. The word sefirot means, really means, I'm not, I'm not going to explain what the sefirot are. There's a lot of explanation behind it. But in, in, a, in a, on one leg, what are the sefirot? The sefirot is the process of creating separation. So it's an, it's an interesting way of remembering it is the word sefirot in Hebrew has got the same consonants as the word separat in English. So mm -hmm. sefirot is all about separation. So in this face example, when we're looking at my face, you've got the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. The separate, separate parts are still there. They are the sefirot. Mm -hmm. When you have the sefirot, that's when they're laid out on the table in front of me. They are separate. When you combine them together in a particular configuration, then an additional set of properties emerges or functionality or insight or intellect emerges from that particular configuration of the underlying parts of the underlying sephirot. Wow. Okay. So that's, this is the concept. Yeah. This is the concept of Pautsuf. And the, the thing about Pautsuf is that every single little thing in the world, no matter how subtle it is, no matter whether it's an abstract concept or whether it's a real serious physical thing, what we would call even an abstract concept to us is a physical thing, but no matter what it is, everything that exists, if, we, if there is something that we can call and label as an entity, that entity is a Pautsuf. The whole world is made up of parts of him, of everything is a part. So let me, let me give you a few examples. Um, the, you have water. Water is made up of, of water atoms. Now, no one is ever in their, in their wildest dreams going to come along and tell you that a water atom is wet. It's only when you have a puddle of water, when you have a collective, an integrated collective of water in a puddle that you can touch it and say, yes, it's wet. Wetness is an emerging property of water when it's, uh, when it's in a puddle. Mm -hmm. Take carbon atoms. Carbon atoms. You can take, you've got individual atoms. You can configure them in one configuration. You get a crystalline substance called graphite. Graphite you can put into a, a pencil, and it's the pencil lead. You rub the graphite over a piece of paper, and layers just rub off. It's very soft. It just layer upon layer rubs off. It's opaque. You can't see through it. It's not very expensive. You take the same carbon atoms, and you configure them in a different way, and you end up with a different crystalline substance called diamond. Diamonds are the, hard, almost, uh, the hardest substance known to man, the hardest natural substance, or one, if not the hard, one of if not the hardest. Very expensive. <laughs> Will not make any marks on a piece of paper, except tear it, <laughs> etc. So you, when we look at the underlying carbon atoms themselves, if I'm just analyzing a single atom, I cannot tell what will emerge when I will connect them into a crystalline lattice. There is something about taking a whole load of atoms together and combining the underlying elements together in a particular configuration, where as a result of that configuration, we have an emerging property, an emerging functionality, an emerging insight, an emerging intellect that comes out of the the process of the configuration. And the ultimate example has got to be the human being. The human being is an ecosystem. We contain within us all different aspects of everything out there in the world. We've got inanimate objects such as minerals. Um, we've got calcium in our bones. We've got plant life. We've got microbiota in our gut. And did you know that the, the microbiota in our gut, they are processing off the food that they process the food that we eat. Mm -hmm. now, they don't have human DNA. In fact, more than 50 percent of the cell count of a human being is probably more than 90 percent of the cell count of a human being. Do not have human DNA. So you've got all of these different beings existing within the human uh, ecosystem and without the microbiota that are in our gut. 
we can't digest our food. They're like an organ, they're like a body organ in their own right. Without them, we die. We are an ecosystem where all of these different organisms come together to form a human being. And look at that human being. Each individual human being has an emerging consciousness, an emerging intellect. In fact, we can just look at the brain. We have The brain has 80 plus billion neurons. When you take one neuron, nobody would ever say that that neuron has any form of intelligence. But when you put that neuron together with 80 plus billion others in a particular configuration, all of a sudden you've got the most incredible uh, the, the repository of intelligence that's known to man, the human brain. That is an emergence. Now, this all has been brought to light um, f um, scientifically by a, a, a Nobel laureate in 19, a seminal paper in 1972 called More is Different by Professor Philip Anderson, and he explains the following. He explains that if you know, if you know the grand theory of particle physics, you cannot predict what's going to happen in chemistry. If you know everything that's going to happen in chemistry, you cannot predict what will happen in biology. If you know everything that happens in biology, you cannot predict what's going to happen in psychology and in economics, etc. Because each higher level, each larger whole is greater than the sum of its parts and has uh, has greater insights and has something to offer. If we were to find the grand theory of everything in particle physics, we cannot understand economics as a result of it. And this is a fundamental limitation in the way in which many people who are called reductionists, they want to reduce everything down to the underlying basic elements of everything and say, if I know how they work, then I know how everything works. And then you have the emergentists who are coming on the scene relatively recently and saying, no, 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 no. There is a place for reductionism, but that's not the whole story. There is something else. And in so many walks of science, in so many fields of scientific endeavor, we see that emergence is rearing its head. And the only way in which to understand those areas of science is by using emergence. And ultimately, a pouncef is an emerging object, is emergence. And sefirat is reduction. And with this, we can, uh, I want to share something on my screen. My pleasure. With this, let's share here. Okay. Right. Can you see? Yeah, we can see. Okay. So you can see on the left hand side, we've got a depiction of the sephirot. The sephirot are uh, this is this is the body parts. This is my facial parts spread out on the table before they're interconnected together. They're separation. They are reduction. We've reduced things down to their component parts. On the other hand, in sharp contrast, were we to take these component parts and configure them in a particular configuration, as we see on the right hand side, then we have a pouncef. We have an integrate. Mm -hmm. We have integration. We have emergence. Now, this image on the right hand side is known as it's famously known as the Eitz Chaim. Unfortunately, many people out there use this image on the right-hand side as uh, an explanation of the Sefirot. And really, it's not an explanation of the Sefirot. The Sefirot can be explained uh, when they are separate. But when we put them together, they are actually a partsuf. What we're looking at is an image of a partsuf. It's a depiction of a partsuf. And many people out there, are, unfortunately, are not aware of this. This concept of Pautsuf is the primary and most fundamental concept of the Arizal's uh, Kabbalah, of the Lurianic Kabbalah. So I'm, st I'm stopping sharing there. So when we understood properly, yeah. when understood properly, this concept of Pautsuf is key to understanding everything we have in the world. And it rationally, in addition to that, it also rationally predicts what the world will emerge into. And ultimately, and I say this rationally as well, it will give us an appreciation of who and what, according to the Arizal, will be the Mashiach, the Messiah. And it's not what anything, anyone thinks. And um, so this is the basic idea in a nutshell. It requires a huge, more, a huge amount of further background detail. And what, but what's amazing is that the Arizal in the 1500s explains this idea, and it's only now with the tools of contemporary science that we can truly 
gain an insight and into this idea and understand what he was really talking about. Amazing, really amazing. And thank you for the diagram. And, and I, you know, until you explained it this way, I still wasn't crystal clear. And now it's just, wow. So thank you for that. We've spoken for a while, so I do want to get to our final question. Um, and so just to wrap up, firstly, thank you. This has been remarkable. And um, I'm spellbound. Uh, and I'm blown away uh, by not just what you've done, but also by the way you've done it, by the way in which you've given us the tools to understand this elegant, profound book, which contains fundamental profound ideas in a way that speaks to us today, in a way that teaches us it's speaking to us today. So my last question to you is, um, how, well, if and how the Torah that you've learned through the, your, your study of the Shomer Emonim, how has it enriched your life, your learning, and your faith? This has obviously been a book that's moved you, inspired you, you've invested much time. How has it changed you? Well, how has it enriched my life? It's a, it's a very big question. Uh, uh, now, of course, it has uh, changed me. Everything we do, ch do changes us. And this book, if I were to take the key component, and I, I probably mentioned it several times, the key component of Shomer and Monim is that it's explaining or giving an introduction to the deepest part of Torah. Mm -hmm. And in particular, demonstrating how this deepest part of the Torah, the Kabbalah, is connected to accelerating technological changes that we see in the world around us. And, and this gives the Torah real meaning to, to me. So it's changing my life by giving real meaning to the Torah. And, and I find this personally nothing less than mind-blowing. Most people out there, or no, I don't know about most people, there are many people out there who are floundering, searching to understand what it's all about. What's the meaning of life? And here we see we have a Torah, we have the deepest part of the Torah, we have the Kabbalah, and we can augment it with contemporary science. And we can genuinely see the bigger picture of what's going on around us. And we can use that to relate to God. And I, I believe that that enriches, that understanding enriches my life in an incredible way. Wow. So, uh... so in a big way. <laughs> uh, on a practical level, if somebody wants to buy Shomer Munim, uh, it is published by Urim, uh, but can they do that through their website? Or is there any other places where they can purchase the book? Well, it's available through Urim website. It's available through Amazon. And uh, ultimately, you know, it'll be quite a while before the, the e-book comes out. But at the moment, it is available on Amazon. It should be available certainly in, in Israel. It's available in many bookstores. In I know in America, in New York, and uh, various Jewish bookstores in America, it should be generally available. But it, it is on Amazon at the moment. Uh, and it's, it's, on, it's available on an Amazon period. And I should also, if we're talking about these things, I should mention my website. Um, that's avinoamfrankel.com. Avinoamfrankel.com. I've got uh, a series of Shomerim Onim Kabbalah explainers, which are all short, uh, five minutes to twelve minutes each. There are ten. There's a series of ten explainers there, going through basic ideas in in Kabbalah and explaining them in contemporary scientific terms. Amazing. So I'm going to say thank you so much again. It's been a great pri privilege, a great pleasure, a great honor, and I wish you much bracha v'atzlocha. Rabbi Solomon, thank you so much, uh, and the privilege is mine. Thank you. Pleasure.